Welcome to the Deep Leadership Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Bob Selden. Bob is a business coach, leader, and best-selling author. Bob has over 50 years of senior management, finance, people, and business experience, and he brings this practical knowledge to the table when working with companies and leaders. He has a new book out called What to Do When Leadership is Needed, which is a workbook for managers who aspire to become great leaders. Now, I'm excited to have him on the show to talk about that transition from when you first become a manager to when you become an effective leader. So Bob, welcome to the show. Thank you, John. Great to be here. A little bit worried about that uh, 50 years at the introduction. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess I have 33. Of, I'm not quite as long, but uh, yeah, I've had quite a few years as well. So 80, yeah. over 80 years of experience on this podcast for those listening. So you're going to get uh, some knowledge, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming, <laughs> before we get yeah. started. So so I want to talk a little bit about that. You've had a long career. When did you get to the point where you said, you know, I really want to focus in on some of these leadership issues and why did leadership kind of be like a, a, an issue you felt strongly about to talk about? Yeah, it's interesting. A couple of reasons. Um, I've thought long and hard about that, actually. It's, it's something that takes a little bit of time to come to when you go back in history and say, when did it the, suddenly the light bulb go on? Uh, probably one of those is when I was, uh, finished my rugby career and I was coaching rugby and uh, there were people in the team who were not the official captain or vice captain, but who were seen by their peers as being um, really, really good. Uh, and so when I had a problem with a particular player or players who weren't performing to their best, I'd go to them and say, look, could you have a talk with John? Um, he's just not at his best at the moment. And that started to, and when I saw the change, rather than being talked to by the coach, they were talked to by one of their colleagues, mm -hmm. I could see that there was real leadership within these people. And I guess that's where I started to think about it. Mm. Mm, interesting. Yeah, I think you're right. Uh, you know, one of the things is sometimes you walk in a room and you can tell naturally who's the leader just by who's everyone's mm. listening to and, and looking mm. at for their opinion. Mm. And I think mm. one of the things as a leader in, in business is you sort of look for who are those uh, who are those default leaders in an organization and how can you work with them to get the message out when, you know, like you say, sometimes it doesn't come well coming from you, but coming from a peer that's uh, yeah. considered, yeah. Um, with, is, that's respected uh, sometimes yeah. is better than coming from you. you know? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, it was interesting. Uh, I guess, too, at that time, I was a banker. I started life as a banker. And um, I became an expert in foreign exchange, believe it or not, <laughs> which is totally different. Um, and when I left school, I just barely got through school because I was too interested in sport. Um, and it wasn't until I was about 27, I actually got into the bank's training division. And I thought, wow, helping people learn is what I really want to do. So I took myself off to evening college, did a four-year course in management, and then follow that up with a, uh, a degree in psychology, <laughs> again at evening. But that's when the leadership thing really got into me and said, yeah, I can help people learn. Yeah, that's fantastic. Now, you, you have a consulting and coaching company. What kind of services do you offer and, and what makes your company unique? What, do, what are the things that you're, you're helping people with? Yeah, um, I have a, a little saying, which is that... Um, Change is about seeing things from a, from a different perspective. And my role is to help people improve their vision. Mm. <laughs> so it's, it's interesting. I was talking with a, a client just yesterday and uh, he runs a very high-end business, um, furniture business and interior design. That's really, really high-end, very, very successful. And he said something quite profound. He said, look, to stay the same... We need to change. Mm. I had to think about that for a moment. And what he was talking about was that he really wanted to keep the business because it was so successful. But he wanted to make sure that um, the systems were better, the structure was a bit better, um, and that he could keep on being successful and have the people in the business being successful. So uh, that's my role, really, is to help them see what they can do, but getting the best out of the, out of the business. Yeah, that, and that's powerful what you just said there. And I think people need to understand that is that sometimes we need, especially if you're an entrepreneur, 
where you're kind of a one man leadership team, um, you know, is that it's a lonely, it's a lonely place. Yeah. And it's good <laughs> to have another, another person like a coach, a mentor, someone as an outsider to bounce ideas off so that you don't get mm. sort of singular in your, in your focus and the way you're thinking. So mm. I know as I, you know, I run a manufacturing business and it's a small business and I know for, for me, I need help and I need a coach and I need, and I work with a coach to help me think differently about the business and see it differently. Cause we, you know, we have our blinders on and we have blind yeah. spots as leaders. So it's good to have yeah. a coach. It's good to have a mentor to help you see yeah. things differently. Yeah. And it, it's, it's interesting. I often get called in by successful businesses. Um, they're the ones that don't really need me, right? <laughs> but they said they're successful because they do that. Exactly what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's, yeah, that's very powerful. Now you, you're you're an author. You've written a number of books, but um, I was going to talk about one book that you wrote. It's called uh, "What to Do When You Become the Boss," and that's been a wildly successful book. Uh, you know, written in multiple languages, uh, sold all over the world. Uh, what would you attribute the success to that book? What what in that? What was the magic bullet in that book that pe that really resonated with people? Well, actually, it was when I was living in Switzerland, John, uh, you talked about going to IMD and I was a coach at IMD in Lausanne and uh, I had a little bit more time because all my um, uh, contacts were back in Australia. So I had a little bit more time. So I started thinking about there's lots of good books out there, but they really haven't been practical enough. Mm. And I think so I ended up writing this book called What to Do When You Become the Boss, which is very, very practical, lots of hands-on tips. And um, it's it's very rewarding, actually, when you see people coming back to you and say, oh, that worked for me, Bob. And uh, I was in my local bookstore here in New Zealand uh, about 18 months ago and talking to the owner about a couple of books and the lady interrupted us. She said, oh, you're Bob Seldon. I said, yes. She said, thank you, Bob. You've changed my life. Uh... That... I, uh, it's a, I, I started out as a new manager and that book of yours changed my life. Ah. And that was, it just blew me away. And for <laughs> once I was lost for words. <laughs> I, I didn't even get a name or contact details. <laughs> I, I love was... that. And because I know, you know, as an author myself, I'll, I'll get, you know, I'll get feedback like that occasionally. Not, yeah. um, not in a bookstore where someone randomly comes up to me, but, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, but when I hear that, that, that something I wrote resonated with someone and helped them get over a hurdle uh, and, and a hang up, that's just powerful. And that's, that's yeah. why we, why we write and then why, yeah. why we hope that we can get people unstuck and get them on their path to their best selves. Right. And yeah. so it's really neat to hear that. Um, yeah. It was, it was very, uh, I'm not sure of the word, but humbling. Yes. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's the way I feel sometimes is that, yeah, the humbling experience, like, yeah. oh shoot, I didn't realize that my book went that far and did such yeah. things. Yeah. It's absolutely right. I had a, um, if I may just read something, a very, very short book uh, about because I knew you'd ask me a question about this. <laughs> um, <laughs> and this was from a, a small business operator, actually, about the book. And he said, I run a very small architectural practice in regional New South Wales, Australia. This book's been a, a fantastic tool uh, assisting me in improving my business and the systems I use. When I had a recent problem with an employer, I was able to dive quickly into the book for the answers, applying them with the practical tips, easy to follow. It worked wonderful. <laughs> um, so that's that's why it was successful, because there wasn't too much theory. It's all about how to. That's that's excellent. And, and you know, I think you're right. And one of the one of the things I, I, I get a sense of having worked, I worked 22 years in, in global corporations. And one of, one of the things I saw is people got promoted. Uh, they got, you know, given a title of manager and they were kind of told to figure it out. I mean, uh, sometimes there was training, but oftentimes it was, well, you're a good engineer. You're the engineering manager. You're a good, yeah, yeah. Uh, you're a good uh, manufacturing supervisor. You're now the manufacturing manager, you know, so so we didn't really do a good job in corporate training those leaders. So you become a manager, right? But then mm. this idea of a leader is something completely different. And you're helping them through this book and through your new book is helping them make that transition to, to yep. leadership. Mm. What, what are the, um, why is it so hard sometimes for, for, for people to make that transition? Yeah, um, it's a challenge. Uh, 
if I could just tell you about the when I uh, my first book, What to Do When You Become the Boss, when I launched the Chinese version in Beijing, mm. uh, I was asked the question, "What's the difference between a leader and a manager?" And you know, <laughs> like, mm. um, well, my answer is that when you become a manager, you're given a title as manager, mm. and it's very much like, uh, oh, you might be given a manager's hat. Yes, yes. So I put my Aussie manager's hat on <laughs> and I said, people will do things for you because of your title, right. uh, because you're a manager. And you only find out whether you're a leader after you've been there for a while. It could be six months or 12 months. And, for example, you might lose your manager's hat. They might be going to self-directed work teams. And so you're just one of the team. Mm. Would people still do things for you now as they used to do when you had your formal manager's hat on. And so um, leadership, they will give you your badge of honour <laughs> when they know that, 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 that you are a leader. So what so you're it's, saying is, yeah, it, the leadership doesn't come from a title. It comes from the, no. the followers. Exactly, exactly, yeah. Yeah, mm. yeah interesting. Yeah, and I think you're right. Sometimes people go into the role. Well, I have the, I have the, I have the office. I have the title. I have the perks. Um, so I'm, I'm now a leader. But that's not yep. what, what it means to be a leader, no. right? Yeah, I think you're. And it's about, interesting, you know. interesting, John. I worked for an extremely good boss who um, helped me define this difference between leaders and managers. And he said, there, "Look, there are four things that that actually leaders do." And I've lived with these and I've talked about them and I coach people in them. And the first one is to they help us understand the environment in which we work. So they're really good at picking out the challenges, uh, the things that are working well, and they help us give that an understanding. It could be the external environment, it could be the economic environment, it could be the organisation environment, but it's all the things that uh, we're working with. So that's the first thing that they do. The second thing they do is they help give us a sense of direction, mm. a why, if you like, the why. He was, this was 30 years ago. He used to talk about the why long before it became <laughs> popular. <laughs> but he was always talking about, we know where we're going, why are we doing this? And the third thing they do is they give us a sense of understanding the shared values that we have mm. and a sense of team so that we're in this together. And the fourth one, which is quite surprising, actually, they give us a sense of feeling of power that we can do things. And I was talking to a lady in a, in a client uh, business a couple of weeks back and I asked her about, why do you like working here? And she said, oh, look, I love the job, but I love even more what my boss allows me to do. Mm. She, said, she said, I'm growing with the job and he's even allowing me to do things that he uh, used to do. She said, sometimes I get it wrong, but we talk about it and I'll make change. She said, it makes me feel so powerful. Mm. She actually used the word powerful. Yeah. And so they're the four things. Um, understanding the environment, sense of direction, feeling of team, and um, the, that feeling of power. Yeah, I, that, love, that, I love that. I love that because I think as, as humans, we want to know that our work matters. We want to know that our voice matters. And I think the leaders that are sensitive to that and make sure that people understand their role in the bigger picture uh, mm. and make sure that they, 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 they're empowered to, to, to act in ways that's consistent with their skill set and things that they want to do and love to do, then you get much more engagement and much more uh, energy in the organization than if you just try to tell people what to do from the corner office. Exactly, right? exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. So, so true. Yeah. And um yeah, and I think that those things that you said mentioned, those four things aren't typically taught when uh, your your typical guy gets promoted to a manager for the first time. They're not no, really no, sat down no, and someone no. puts their arm around them and say, okay, here's these four things that you've got to watch out for, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's, yeah. In fact, it's it's more, you know, good luck and uh, yes, letting you know if you have any true. questions, right? Yeah. Yeah. So... Uh, yeah, you've got uh, you've got a new book coming out called "What to Do When Leadership Is Needed." Now, mm -hmm. I want to ask you a little bit about the origins of this book because I think you mentioned it took you a little while to write this one. Fourteen years. Fourteen, 14. years. <laughs> yes. So, what was the origin for this this book? 
I'm a slow learner. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, once again, it, it goes back to that question I was asked in Beijing about the difference between leader and manager. And I went away thinking, well, I've written a book about management, the how-tos. Now, how do you write a book about leadership? Yeah. And I think, like you, I believe that leadership can't be taught and you can't get leadership out of reading a book. I thought, how, the, how am I going to do that? And over time, it started to come to me that we learn about leadership from our life experiences, from the yeah. stories that we hear, and how we reflect on those stories. And so what I've done is I've collected stories from um, the last 14 years or so that people will understand. For example, um, uh, a lot came out of the global financial crisis. Um, I have a really good one. I'll maybe talk about that later. Um, the Gulf of Mexico, the great oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico, and what were the leadership lessons there? Um, the uh, Murdoch fiasco with News of the World in London where they actually um, hacked that murdered schoolgirl's phone. Um, oh, the Tour de France. I'm a cyclist, so I'm keen yeah. on cycling. Um, so the 2008 Tour de France uh, with some fabulous leadership stories, even though there were three or four um, cyclists taken away by the French police for drug. <laughs> um, and all these stories that I've collected, 27 of them, um, you can actually learn from them. And so I say, look, here's a story to learn from. Now, if you've got your own story, um, just keep an eye out for, once again, I've got four things. I'm big on the four things. So you need to reflect about them. And the first one is to say, what went well or not so well in this story? Um, what did we learn? Uh, what do we need to do differently? And what do I need to plan for now? So... The, the book is about the 27 stories and each story is followed by those four questions mm. and we get people to reflect on it. And at the back of the book, I've actually got a leadership plan that you can transfer the learnings that you have to that if you wish. And you can you can download that too. Why, why do you think stories are so powerful? Ah, I know, I know yeah. uh, my books, my first two books are just full of stories. So uh, I'm, I'm doing the same thing in the first book. I've got 22 stories in that book and, and I right. think there's 50 some odd in the, in the second book. Yeah. But why do you think stories are so important and why do you think they resonate? Why do you think they teach yeah. us uh, so much? Well, if you look at history um, from the um, dawn of, of humankind, We've learned through stories. Yeah. Um, we things are passed on about how we survive, how we thrive, and they're always passed on through stories. And that was long before the written word, long before you or I started to write books. And those stories were generally given by leaders, mm. and they were generally about leadership. Mm. And they become so powerful. Um, and there are stories that. You know, you can go back to the Roman times and you can you can see some of the philosophers from the Roman times. And we still talk about those stories, the leadership lessons that we got. So that's why I think the less and we remember them so well. Um, <laughs> there's a lovely this appropriate at the moment with um, the sadness of the, the Queen's funeral. Mm -hmm. But there's some fabulous stories coming out. And there's this lovely one which um, you may have heard about. Um, uh, a couple of tourists in the forest near where the Queen used to go walking occasionally, Balmoral Castle. So she was walking one day with her security guard and um, came across these two tourists and they said, hello, how are you, etc. They got chatting and the tourist said to the Queen, oh, we believe the Queen lives near here somewhere. Do you see her? Do you see her? And the Queen said, no, I've not actually seen her, but my good friend David here sees her regularly. <laughs> <laughs> so, of course, the tourist actually focused it on the security guard, David, and said, oh, photo, can take a photo. So they got the Queen to take a photo of oh, them with the security guard. <laughs> and then the security guard, being very good, actually worked it around to the stage where, look, I'll take a photo of you with, with my friend. And uh, I'm told that later the Queen uh, told the story. She said, I would have loved to have seen the look on their faces when they showed their friends back home <laughs> their, their, their pics. Oh, we almost met the Queen. And they say, you did meet the Queen. 
just look on look some, on your currency if you want to know what she looks like. <laughs> but there are some nice leadership stories, uh, leadership things there about the Queen actually deflecting it so easily. Yeah. And and working with the security guard and giving him the power to actually manage the whole situation. Yes, yes. And then, of course, he brilliantly brings it around to the fact where, oh, can I take a photo of you with my friend? So there's two really nice little leadership stories in that that's why we remember them that's why we learned from them. Uh, yeah that's so that's so true I, it sort of makes me think of i had a um you know as a as a small business owner i have a manufacturing business and we i had an engineer working for me and he we were we were starting the business we started it from ground up and he wanted to run all the engineering drawings a certain way well i've been doing engineering for a long time and i knew there were <laughs> there were pluses and minuses about the way he wanted to do it but I could have said, no, we're going to do it my way, but I wanted him to have the power to do it. So yeah. I said to him, I said, you do it your way. Let's, let's, let's roll that out. Like you want to do it. And that's what it's, that's what our system is going to be. So even to this day, that's our company system. And it was, came from the engineer. He owned the process. He, he was, had pride about it because it was his yeah. way. And I could yeah. have just like the queen could have, you know, taken everything and pointed it to her he kept it pointed at the security guard and the same thing yeah. there. I just let it, I let the engineer run with it and yep. that was his baby. And that's, that's his legacy to the business. And, uh, mm -hmm. and I feel, I'm glad I did that because now he owned, he owned it and, and yep. his fingerprints are on my company, you know, that are, that are special, that were his. Yep. Yeah. And I think that's a very important lesson, John, that every one of us likes to own things. Yeah. And if we can help people own their job, it makes a huge difference to their motivation. Yes. Huge. Yeah. When they feel like they have some degrees of freedom and some control on their, yeah. uh, on the things that they do, they feel, yep. you know, they feel, they feel excited to come to work because they have a sense of um, independence, if you will, even within <clears throat> a bigger firm. So they, they have mm. some degrees of freedom. I think, you know, I left corporate um, after, you know, 22 years, I left because my degrees of freedom every year I was with these big mm. companies shrunk to the point where yeah. I felt like I had no ability uh, to, to make decisions on my own as, as a yep. vice president. So, you know, there was a, I had to report to all these different managers for every different function to the point yeah. where I lost, I didn't have any control of my own decision-making. So yep. for me, it was like, I'm frustrated with that. And I left. And I think people do that. They leave when they feel like they don't have that control. Yeah. Yeah. And the people at the coalface are the people who really understand what needs to be done. Yes. So they're the ones that need to own the ability to make those decisions within the parameters and the guidelines that you're setting. Mm. Right, right. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So this, like you said, this book is laid out a little bit differently. It's story based. Uh, you mm -hmm. go through these stories and you have questions at the end. So how how do leaders uh, use this book? How, how would mm. they apply this book? Well, um, I've actually, after writing the stories and writing the book, I looked at the stories and they and categorised them. They, they okay. start to fall into a couple of categories, um, things like managing crises, things like uh, being creative, um, things like uh, customer focus. So I think there are about 12, from memory, 11 or 12 categories that these stories fall into. So if a manager has um, a particular issue at the moment where, for example, they want their people to be uh, show more creativity in the work that they're doing. He can pull out that particular story and use it as the basis for team uh, team meeting. And then I have some questions that he can or she can use uh, in facilitating that, that meeting. And those questions are different, obviously, for each story, depending on the story. Mm. Um, and also, I encourage people to get their, um, their team to talk about uh, their stories, their own stories. Yeah, um, and they're just so powerful. They are so powerful. For example, there's one in there that I use on customer service. So, uh, my wife, when we were living in Sydney, she was a senior manager in an organisation, and she employed another manager. Had to move from Melbourne to Sydney. Now, that's a huge move mm. um, because the manager was married, um, so the husband had to come to Sydney as well. He had to find a job. <laughs> And uh, so the first week we were there, we took them out to, out to dinner at our little favourite restaurant. We had a really nice dinner. Come the dessert, and um, our dessert arrived in those big plates with the wide uh, rim around them. 
and typed around in chocolate around there. Her, uh, my wife's manager and her husband was welcome to Sydney. Oh wow! Now the wait the waitress had obviously listened to our conversation <laughs> and told the chef, and out came this. Now they've talked about that for years. Wow! And that was about fifteen years ago. I still talk about it, <laughs> and that is so powerful. So in, in a couple of things from that story is one is that, that that whoever was your waiter, waitress was empowered to do that sort of thing. Exactly. And, and, and you know, in the, in the chef or the baker, whoever is preparing the meals was completely on board with as well. Didn't say, oh, you exactly. can't do that or, and, uh, and yeah. And um, just, and, and they had to be, they had to be trained or at least they had to be aware that look for the interesting thing that's happening at the table that you could, you could feature. You could, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. So, so you, yeah. so you, so they raise the awareness and then that person gets to have, gets to create an experience for their customer. Uh, yeah. That's a memorable experience like yeah. that. Very, very interesting story, very powerful story and very unusual story. in today <laughs> yeah. we rarely hear that when you, someone goes above when it comes to customer yeah. service, usually it's, it's the other way yeah. around. <laughs> so and that it's no wonder that that restaurant was an award-winning restaurant. <laughs> yeah, well, absolutely. Yeah, and yeah. when and when yeah, and I just I loved it. And it that, wasn't top. Of, it wasn't top of the range. Oh, it was yeah. a middle mid mid range restaurant. Mm. Yeah, but I love to hear that because it's just saying that you know someone's doing something right at the top of that organization with exactly. empowering the people to do things that they feel is exactly. right. And, exactly. Exactly. Hey, here's the things to look out for that yeah. you can do to make it a memorable evening. So yeah, what, a, exactly. what a great what a great story. Um, yeah, you say, um, and I think this is really interesting. You say that, that, uh, <laughs> meetings are boring and I, and I agree with that. So, <laughs> and, and I think you're saying that if you use these stories as a way to generate conversations, you're going to mm. get less boring. You're going to get uh, yeah. much more activity, yeah. uh, when they do that, uh, when they go through these stories, answer these questions, they're going to be energized. And then if you, I, I'm assuming as you get used to doing that, then you start rolling in your own stories in there, right? Yes. Is, yeah. is that it? So you're, yeah. you're saying, okay, now here's, let's talk about, let's talk about what's happening on third shift production and you yeah. tell the story and yeah. then you're then okay, what's going, you know, yeah. and you go through the True. four questions. True. So you've had a chance to like, it's almost like, uh, you know, learning to, to do this exercise with training, training wheels. And then, and then you're off to do it on your yeah. own. So I think yeah. this is a really powerful tool for young managers, new managers to say, okay, well, here's, you have, you have something you can talk about here. You yeah. Know, here's a, here's a, but, here's a methodology. There's, and there's also, there's, there's two other things I encourage managers to do with meetings. And one is to um, share the, the leadership of the meeting. Mm. Okay. So I have what I have one client at the moment Um and each month, a different member of the team runs the team meeting. Oh, nice. Yeah. So it's not, not the manager. And you should see the change in the people. And it was interesting. There was one lady who I think it was the second meeting we did this. She said, I hate this. I don't want to do this. She got up and ran a brilliant meeting. <laughs> and it was so pleasing to see, oh, that was all right. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. I think, I think that's, other, sometimes it's hard for people to do that to, you know, yeah. when you ask them to step into a role like that. And, and, and what I've found is that uh, you, you, you're always surprised by who steps up and who doesn't, yeah. you know, you're always surprised. I'm always surprised like, oh, wow, that they did a better job than I normally do. Or, you know, that person, I didn't really realize that person had it in, in them. And I yeah. think when you do those things, you get a chance to see another facet of your, of your, the people yeah. that work for you. And it's it's also very useful for the manager to learn to hand over the the, the reins to someone else and to see yes. the development in their people. And the the second thing I encourage managers to do is to look at the venue where you're having the meeting, mm. and because leadership is contextual. Um, so, for example, I had a regional manager once who was looking at developing more creativity within her, within her team. So she ran the meeting in the local park. She had a picnic. She had a picnic meeting in the local park and uh, she took a little portable whiteboard along <laughs> and they all sat around, had a picnic and did their meeting. And she said that the ideas that came out because it was so different and that's what yeah. she was looking for, difference, yeah. creativity. 
Yeah. When I was in corporate, I always did like an offsite planning session every year with, with my yeah. leadership team. Just And we did it in different places every time, just as a way to like, you know, you're, you're used to sitting in the same conference room with the same whiteboard. And so you just sort of switch it up yeah. a little bit. And, um, and, and that always sort of kind of boosted the creativity and also yeah. created a memorable event for the team. Yes. So they mm. think back and, oh, you remember when we were at here, we talked yeah. about that. And, uh, yeah. and so they remember the location and the, and the decision that was made during that meeting. And you can yes. always call back to it throughout the year, you know. We said when we were yeah. when we were there, we were going to do this exactly. right as a team. Exactly, you know, exactly. and it's great. It gives you that, that gives you that hook. Mm. Yeah, it gives you your hook, and it and it and every and I also say this too is I think the other thing is really important is when you when you build these shared experiences, these common experiences, you can always call back to them, and and you have yeah. these shared uh, versus uh, you know some you know management's always over here, workers are always over here marketing is over here engineering is over here yeah. when you combine and when you have these shared experiences there's something you can build on because you all mm -hmm. have seen something in the same way and have that same recollection recollection yeah. of events which you know my time in the submarine that was a big thing we had we all had the shared experience about what just happened right because we're all in it together mm -hmm. was, nobody mm -hmm. on the outside we were all in it <laughs> and we all witnessed it the same thing so we had this shared bond of like Oh my gosh, I can't believe that just happened, right? Yeah. <laughs> and we're still alive, right? So, or yeah. or whatever, you know, but we had those shared experiences and we'll always remember those. And we had that bond yeah. because we had that, we built up that shared, uh, yeah, that shared experience. So, yeah. yeah. It's interesting. I've got a good friend who was a submariner too. So he talks about that same thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, there's no avoiding it. You're, 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 yeah, you're there. Yeah. yeah. You're, you can't, uh, you can't avoid a, a relationship or a person. You're, you're, you know, no. You're, you're you're locked in a metal tube so <laughs> yeah but this is um so i think this is really encouraging and i really uh encourage people who are listening in to take a look at this because it's uh it's what to do when leadership is needed because i think it's a it's a unique approach to uh to helping managers facilitate those discussions uh and help solve problems and kind of build build that team uh up to that next level so i think you know i commend you for coming up with a creative way to uh, to have that uh, have those oh, discussions and and uh, and to build that relationship as a, as a young manager into a leader. So uh, I think it's a fantastic uh, resource. So how can people find out about you, uh, the book, and anything else you're, that you're working on? Well, obviously, of course, it's available on uh, the good book sites like Amazon, etc. But if they go to my website, it's Bob Selden. That's S E L D E N. Um, you'll see everything there that they need okay very good we'll put links in the show notes uh for all that and i'm happy to do it happy to do a linkedin uh contact as well if people want to go okay go to linkedin yeah mm. okay we'll put that in there as well so yeah that's that's excellent so again uh the book is uh what to do when leadership is needed and um Bob, it's really great to meet you and uh, have this conversation i learned a lot and i appreciate all the work that you're doing Oh, thanks, John. It's been great. Pleasure. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you again. Well, that's it for today. Thank you for listening to Deep Leadership. If you like this podcast, please subscribe and share so we can continue to build a world with better bosses. Until next time, this is John Rennie saying take care and lead well.